Good evening and welcome to the Experience Bible Study. On this Tuesday evening, I'm Pastor John Kenny, the pastor of Third Baptist Church, and we're so grateful that you're with us again on this glorious Tuesday night. This is the day the Lord has made, and we are going to rejoice, and we are going to be glad in all of it. God has brought us through seven more days, and we're grateful to who God has been to us. We are grateful for who God is being to us, and we are grateful for who God will be to us in the future. For all of you all who are joining us tonight, whether you are a first-time attendee, whether you are a repeat attendee, whether you just happen to be strolling through and you just stumbled across this teaching tonight, we're grateful that you are with us, the Third Baptist Church family. We are a church that's trying to accomplish one vision, and that is to transform the world, one disciple at a time, by the living of our faith. Because we believe faith should be lived and not just talked about. So we welcome you tonight to our virtual time of study, to the glory of our God. It's going to be an exciting time tonight. It's going to be a challenging time tonight. It's going to be one of those nights where prayerfully the light bulb goes off in all of our minds and, and fresh revelation penetrates our hearts to help us to see exactly where we find ourselves in this particular season of history as it relates to the evolution and the perpetuation and the continuation of the greatest creation that God could have assembled, and that is called the church. Tonight, we're going to be looking at the church and culture, the church and culture, looking at the doctrine of the church, because it's very imperative that we understand that right now, what we are uh, witnessing and what we're sharing and what we are having forced to live through it's not some new phenomenon. It is not something that is strange. It's not something that is uh, shocking to God. It may be to us. But what we're living through right now is, I believe, it's really a, a, a further testimony to the words that Jesus uttered to those bewildered, confused disciples as they wrestle with the question when Jesus says, who do men say that I am? So we're in this, in this space tonight. Hopefully and prayerfully when we leave, we'll be different than we did coming tonight. Amen. So I hope you have your pen. I hope you have your pad. I hope you have your Bible. I hope you have your highlighter. Whatever it is, your notepad, make yourself some notes. Uh, write down some things you maybe didn't understand or didn't know before. And let us go tonight to that place where we can always find some sense of resolution to our challenges, and that is in the word of the Lord. Amen. So let's pray. God, we thank you for tonight. We honor you. We bless you. For those who have gathered tonight, O oh Lord God, for wherever they may have gathered from, wherever you may have brought us from, we ask you now to bring us to a central place of centering in our minds and our spirits. God, we ask you to disconnect us from all of the minutia of the day, that as we gather tonight around your word, we might find something tonight that's going to help sustain us as we move further in this calling, not only as disciples, but in the calling of being your church. Help us to find tonight, oh God, that sweet spot to rest in, that all of our hearts and minds might be comforted as you now speak to us in a fresh and new way. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen and amen. My brothers and my sisters, uh, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, the doctrine of the church. Uh, ecclesiology is really what the, it's the theological term for what it all means. And, and, and so we're going to be looking at uh, the proclamation of the church, which, which was discussed in, or, or, or communicated in Matthew chapter number 16, um, beginning at verse 13 down through verse number 20 tonight. But before we go there, you can turn there in your Bibles now. We'll, we're going to be looking at that tonight. But before we go there tonight, we want to we want to address some some things. First of all, when we talk about the doctrine of the church, 
uh, we talk about the ecclesiology, and ecclesiology is the study of the Christian church. Ecclesia, which ecclesiology is derived from, ecclesia is a Greek word uh, for congregation or for church. And, and you see that really, you see that really lived out in the book of Acts, Acts chapter number two, that after they received the power from the Holy Spirit, then they began to uh, spend time together studying the word of God, sharing food, breaking bread, sharing all they had. They began to grow in these small groups, home churches, but it was a, the ecclesia, it was a called out community of God that would form the institution of the church. And that's important to understand tonight because it lets us know that you and I have been called out from something, hear me, called out from something to something, that God called you out of what God called you out of to what God wanted you to be a part of. There it is right there. You ought to write that one down. That God called you out of something, that you might be a part of something that God was now creating, that God was establishing, that God was instituting. So your, your placement in the church is not something that is accidental, something that is coincidental. Your placement in this ecclesia, in this called out group of people is something that is purposeful and something that is very intentional in all of our lives. So the ecclesia is a Greek word for congregation or church. And the church is the family of baptized believers in Jesus Christ who gather, listen, who gather for community and they scatter for cause. They gather for community. We, we come together for community and then we scatter for cause. Don't miss that. We, we don't come together just to come together and then go back to our respective locations and do nothing. But we come together for community. And then when we leave community, we scatter for cause. Now, it's important to understand tonight because when we think about this idea of the church, we think about that wonderful building that's located on a corner. We think about that wonderful uh, mega campus that's been erected that has all these beautiful uh, 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 things that go along with it, that has these numerous ministries that go along with it. But the church at its fundamental core is not the building that you go to. The church is not the institution that you belong to. The, the church, if you really break it down, the church has a universal, but it also has an individual significance. That you as an individual, me as an individual, we as people, we, we represent, we are the church. We make up the church. It is a collective body that comes together, a body of believers in Jesus Christ who've been baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. We come together representing the church. But when we leave that community, that, that gathering for community, we don't leave as individuals, but we leave as a representation of the church. So wherever you go, wherever you find yourself, hear me well tonight, wherever you find yourself, you find yourself or you are representing not yourself, but you are representing the church, the universal church, the universal body of believers, which is why we say we gather for community, but we scatter for cause. And so it's important for us to gain that understanding or, 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 or recommit ourselves to that understanding. Because if we're waiting on somebody else, if we're waiting on the church, that building to be an integral factor in what's around us, we're going to fail. We're in, a, we're in a space right now. And I believe that God has allowed us to come to this space and this time and this hour post-pandemic where we were forced to, to stay separated, stay isolated uh, for the purpose of really discovering who we are as the church. We, we are in a, we're in, a, in a precarious place right now because the space we find ourselves occupying is a space where that building that we go to is not going to be as relevant as it once was. 
people are not flocking to the building, to the church building. And because people are not flocking to the church building, the building itself now has seemingly lost some of its luster, if you will. And if you equate the church with the building, then the culture is never going to be altered. The, cu the culture is never going to be addressed. So it's important for us to understand tonight that the church is not that building that you and I go to. That God does not intend for that building to have a positive effect in as much as God intends for the people who make up the church, there it is right there, to have an, a, a positive effect in the lives of all humanity. So uh, the church is instituted or initiated and sustained by God. The church is something that God initiates and God sustains. And in fact, five, it's a foreign concept to scripture to think about being in universal church without attending a local church. What does that mean? That means this, that you cannot say you are a member of a church <laughs> and then never set foot in the church. Now, there are extenuating circumstances people have, health challenges people have, uh, 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 you know, job situations that people have where they may not be able to physically set foot in the church. Let me take you back a minute because we're in a paradigm right now. We're in a paradigm right now where it's not so much about you being physically in a building as it is about you physically connecting to the church. It's about you being able to connect to the church and that connection in this space, in this hour we find ourselves in, is either going to be physical or it's going to be virtual. The idea there is, as a Christian, as a person, as a person who's in relationship with God, as a person who represents or makes up the universal church, you it is an oxymoron to say, I am a member of the church, and then have no connection whatsoever to a local fellowship. So if you're making notes today, tonight, I want you to write this note down tonight. The note simply says this, I must connect to a local fellowship. Whether it's going to be physical, whether it's going to be virtual, uh, connection is important. Connection is vital to my survival spiritually. But connection is also important for the continuation of my responsibility, my role in the life of the church. Now, I said all that on the front end to bring us to where I want us to hang our hat tonight and for us to really delve into tonight. So if you go to Matthew chapter number 16 and you begin reading at verse number 13 in Matthew chapter 16, you'll find these words in the beginning part of that pericope. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, listen, who do people say that the son of man is? Verse 14, well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then he asked them, he being Jesus, asked them, who do you say I am? Verse 16 says, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Now, this is where it gets crucial for us. Simon gives the, the statement, you are the Messiah. Jesus then replies in verse 17, you are blessed Simon, son of John, because my father, listen, my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit or allow on earth will be permitted or allowed in heaven. What does that mean? It simply means this. Peter has this 
divine revelation of who Jesus Christ is. He says, you are the Messiah. You are the anointed one. You are the one sent of God. Hey, glory to God. You are the Messiah. You are the Christos. You are the Christ. You are the anointed one. That information, that insight, that revelation could not be given by human beings. Peter correctly identified who Jesus is. And Jesus says to him, he says, you did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you, you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Okay. Peter is not the church. Peter is an instrument that God would use to further advance the cause of the church. Listen, listen. Peter could only be identified as the ch that, that, that platform, that, that place, that space that God would use based upon his understanding of who Jesus Christ is. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the anointed one. You are the one sent of God to fulfill, listen, to fulfill the purpose of God. Okay, that's important. Because when you and I come to a space in our lives where we have gained that revelation, when you have gained a revelation of who Jesus Christ is, right, that God has revealed to you who he is, you then become what some would identify as the space or the conduit, that's a better word to use, the conduit through which the church will now be facilitated. Peter confessed a spiritual truth. Peter confessed a divine revelation of spiritual truth as it relates to who Jesus is. And Jesus says, because of what you have now come to the awareness of, the knowledge of, the revelation of, I am going to establish my church on that truth. The truth of who I am. Not the truth of who you are, Peter, but the truth of who I am as Jesus Christ, the Messiah, through you. Okay, that's important, my brothers and sisters. Because what it tells us is it says that the church is, first of all, established on the truth of who Jesus Christ is. That there cannot be a church that is constructed on this illusion or this misconception or this misinterpretation of Jesus Christ. Not every church is communicating the truth of Jesus Christ. Not every church is rooted in the truth of Jesus Christ because churches are Christ-centered. Churches are Christ-rooted. He's telling Peter that this church is not going to be personality-rooted in you, Peter. This church is going to be, the church is going to be rooted in the divinity of who Jesus Christ is. That's important. Because when you find in this culture we live in today, where churches are rooted in personalities, churches are personality driven, churches are personality centered, and Christ is not the anchoring point. Christ is not the central key to the church, what you discover is that that church is not a church that's ordained and instituted by God. Remember now, the church is initiated and sustained by God. Initiated and sustained by God. Everybody assembling a church is not assembling a church because it has been initiated by God. 
Y'all 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 better hear me tonight. And we live in a culture right now where you are seeing personalities who have been lifted above Jesus. He's telling Peter, you're not the personality of the church. You are just the conduit through which the church is going to flow. <laughs> there it is right there. You, you, you are not the church. The church is me, Jesus says. I, I am the church. And so because you understand that I am the church, I can use you for church purposes. And so you have to understand and be clear today that everything that's, that, that claims to be the church is not established on the truth of Jesus Christ. And that's why in this culture we find ourselves in, it's important to understand, it's important to know, it's important to realize, it's important to embrace the fact that the church is and has to be and has been ordained to be anchored in Jesus Christ. Not only does he say that 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 truth is going to be an anchoring point, but then he also says something. He says that the church is going to be called into a culture of conflict. Go back to what he says. He says, I will, and upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. What does that mean? That means, my brothers and sisters, that whether you are like it or not, whether you accept it or not, whether you ask for it or not, the church of Jesus Christ has been called into this cosmic culture of conflict. And we see it playing out every day of our lives. It's not something new to God. It's not a new phenomenon to God. Jesus understood and he was letting his disciples understand or letting them know in no uncertain terms that what you are now a part of, you are now a part of a culture of conflict. That's important. Because if the church is truly going to represent Jesus Christ in this hour, if you as a believer that has church assigned to you. If you're going to survive in this hour, you have to understand that you've been called to a culture of conflict. So when we survey the landscape and we see some areas of the church claiming to be pro-life in one area, but restricting choice in another area. They claim to be pro-life when it comes to a woman having the right to choose for her body, but they're not pro-life when it comes to banning assault weapons. They claim to be pro-life when it comes to saving unborn or saving fetuses in the womb, but they're not pro-life when it comes to seeing innocent children and people getting killed in schools, in churches, in shopping centers, in, at everywhere. This is the church. This is this church we live in. The, 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 the church that on one hand declares this moral order and then on the other hand, factions of the church that represent the church where they have given way to all sense of morality whatsoever. So Jesus is telling his disciples that when you, you have to understand that, that you, this, you're, not, you're not being called, God help us tonight, you, you're not being called to a ride of comfort, but you're being called into a culture of conflict. Again, look at what he says. And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. That you and I as believers, we are called into a culture of conflict. But the good news is that, he, Jesus says, and the gates, the powers of hell will not conquer it. <laughs> now, there has to be a clear distinction here. Because not every church 
is going to withstand. Hear me well. It's going to withstand the powers of hell. Listen, listen. The church is going to be victorious if the church is committed to survival. And how is the church going to survive? I'm glad you, I'm glad you asked. The church is going to survive when the church understands who the foundation of the church is. He says, you, you are the Christ. Jesus says, you did not learn that from human beings. Now I say to you upon this rock, because you've gotten this revelation of who I am, the church will survive as long as the church understands who the foundation of the church is. That as long as we don't lose sight to who the foundation of the church is, we will experience the cosmic challenge. We will experience the conflict. We will experience the cultural conflict that exists because light and dark cannot reside in the same space. Good and evil coexist in the same space. That's a part of the theology of God, the theodicy of God. We talked about that earlier, that, that God permits good and evil to exist in the same space and we don't understand why. And we cannot alter God's decision. So Jesus is now calling them into this space where they're not going to get away from the conflict. They're not going to get away from the struggle. They're not going to get away from the, the, the cosmic battle that exists. But as long as they understand who the church is rooted in and who is the central focus of the church upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, listen now, that's important. It's his church. It, it, it is Jesus' church. And as long as we understand it is his church and we rest in him. Behind me, you'll see this wonderful plant growing up in the corner over my shoulder. It reminds us tonight that as Jesus said in John, I am the vine and you are the branches. He says, and apart from me, you can do nothing. So if we understand that he is the church, and we are connected to him who is the church, then as long as we stay connected to him and allow the truth of who he is to reside through us and reign through us and flow through us, the church will always survive. It does not matter what God's church has to encounter. God's church will always survive if the people who make up the church are committed to survive. That's key. Because when you're personality driven, when you're, when you're driven or centrally rooted in who is out front, we lose focus of the essence and the purpose and the power that resides in the church, not just in collectively, but in the church individually. He tells him, he says, I will build my church upon this rock and the powers of hell will not conquer it. That means hell has been unleashed against the church. And we, again, we are in a culture where we're seeing hell that has been unleashed against the church. And some of the hell that we're seeing unleashed against the church is taking place in the church. That, that's what Jesus wants us to understand tonight. That there's going to be this conflict of church and culture. And, and, and what he wants us to understand tonight is not only the church is victorious if committed, but here's the piece I want you to hang your hat on. The church is equipped to effect culture. And effecting culture means the church is equipped to cause something to happen in the culture. What do you see there, that preacher? Go back and look at the last part. Whatever you forbid or whatever you lock on earth, whatever you bind on earth, whatever you do away with on earth, whatever you get away with on earth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. 
And whatever you permit on earth, whatever you allow on earth, whatever you unlock on earth will be unlocked in heaven. He said, I've given you keys to the kingdom. I've given you something that will allow you access to accomplish whatever objective the church needs to accomplish. Listen, in the culture that it finds itself in. All of us, all of us, well, most of us, if we've ever had the experience of driving or you've had kids and when they grew up and they got to a certain age and you willfully gave them the keys to the car or the keys to the house, you gave them keys. Those keys gave them access to some things that they once did not have access to. They could come home by themselves from school. They had access to some freedom that they once did not have. They had access to be able to drive, to go to and fro, access to some freedoms, a movement that they once did not have before. Jesus is telling us tonight, God, I feel it right here, that I, I've given you keys that you may now have access to some things that you once did not have access to. I've given you keys to have a level of mobility that you once did not have before. I've given you keys that will allow you to accomplish or to effect or to cause something to happen in the culture that you once did not have access to. This is a rabbinical, judicial kind of statement that has judicial terms that whatever you restrict on earth, it will be restricted in heaven. <laughs> and whatever you let go of or loose or permit on earth, it will be permitted in heaven. When you think about the courtroom and the judge who, who, who restricts certain things from taking place in the courtroom, God, I feel it. That when the judge declares there will be no talking in the courtroom, the, the judge has restricted talking. And because of who the judge is, there is no talking. When, 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 when the judge permits conversation or permits presentation of information during a trial in the courtroom, that information is presented. But when the judge restricts certain information from being disseminated, it cannot be. Y'all y'all better hear me tonight. And the same way Jesus is letting us know that tonight, the same rabbinical, judicial understanding you have in the culture exists in the kingdom that I've called you into. That if you understand that you have access to a judge, you have access to a judge, a, a judge who will allow you to bind on this earth whatever you need to bind or restrict or to limit or to not allow. You've got keys, keys, access to a space, to a God, to a judge, to somebody who has the kind of authority that will either permit or disallow Whatever it is that you desire to permit or to disallow, listen, listen, not for your own personal gain, but for the perpetuation of the survival of the church. He did not give them keys to the kingdom for their own personal gratification. He gave them keys to the kingdom so that the church could continue to flourish. The church could continue to fulfill the church's objective. The church could continue to effect change in the culture. He did not give them keys to satisfy their own selfish agenda, satisfy their own personal wishes, satisfy their own egotistical desires, but he gave them keys 
to further accentuate the foundation of truth upon which the church was established. Y'all better hear me tonight. He did not give them keys to develop a cult. He gave them keys to perpetuate the kingdom call of God that was on their lives. And so what you have to understand, my brothers and sisters, is that not only collectively do we have access, but you as an individual who represents the church, you have access to a place of power, to a source of power that will enable you to effect change in the culture that you find yourself in. This change, this ability to effect change is not because of who you are, but it's because of who you have anchored yourself in. He says, upon this rock, I will build my church. Listen to what Jesus says. And the powers of hell will not conquer it. <laughs> One translation says, and the gates of Hades shall not overcome it. Gates will be raised. Powers will be released. Powers will be unleashed against the perpetuation and the truth of the church. But Jesus says, as long as you are anchored in me, hey, glory, as long as I am central to the church, as long as I am the central and primary focus of the church, it does not matter what kind of power of hell has been unleashed against it, it will not conquer Jesus's church and the culture now wants us to believe that the culture is one the culture wants us to believe that even though they name the name of Christians name the name of Jesus call on God but their purpose and their intentions and their desires are far from God your 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 lips are near me but your hearts are far away from me is what God told the prophet Isaiah so in this hour we live in, my brothers and sisters, in this hybrid hour we live in, I believe God caused us to go inward, isolated, for the purpose of the church reestablishing her presence in the culture. I believe God forced us through COVID to go inward, to go indoors, to go inside, to, to hide, if you will, so that we might receive a fresh dose of power, a fresh anointing of power. Not our power, but his power that we might gain fresh understanding and fresh revelation that, that everything and everybody naming Jesus is really not the church of Jesus. That everybody lifting holy hands, if you will, saying amen, if you will, preaching a gospel, not the gospel, but preaching a gospel is not the church. That Jesus tells Peter that I'm going to build my church on. That's not the kind of church that Jesus lets us know. Because the church that's rooted or founded by Jesus is one that is centered on the truth of Jesus. I told you last week he says in Luke 4, I have this spirit of the Lord is upon me, he has anointed me to preach the good news of the gospel, to set captives free, to give sight to the spiritually blind, to release the oppressed, to declare the acceptable year of the Lord's favor. If the church that you are part of, if the church that you are hearing in the culture is not committed to lifting not only the name of Jesus, but the ministry in its totality of who Jesus is, 
then you have to question whether or not that is the church of Christ or the church of the culture. Because there is a church of the culture that exists today. And it exists in the midst of the church of Christ. I'll give you an analogy, a story is out of scripture, then I'll let you go. Jesus says a story about how a, 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 a farmer had his servants plant seeds. They planted wheat in the ground. And when the wheat came up, there was weeds along with the wheat. And they said, who did this? And the owner said, the enemy did this. That under the cloak of darkness, <laughs> an enemy came in and planted weeds in the midst of the wheat. They said, do you want us to pull them up and tear them down? He said, no, let them grow together, side by side. Let them grow together. Because when it's all said and done, the harvester will separate the wheat from the weeds. In essence, he's saying to us that the church, that it has the real stuff, the stuff of Christ, will survive. But the church of the culture won't survive. There's only so many lies that can be constructed. There's only so many conspiracy theories that can be gone through. There's only so many misrepresentations and miscommunications and disinformation that can be assimilated or distributed rather, disseminated. There's only so much that can be done. But when you understand who Jesus is and you're rooted in who he is, you realize the church will always be victorious if we're committed to surviving. Surviving by resting in who he is, communicating who he is, being truthful to who Jesus is. And the church will effect change in the culture when the church understands she has been equipped to effect change. So tonight, my brothers and sisters, if you name the name of Jesus Christ, you are more than a disciple. You are the church. And as you live your days and struggle with your faith and walk through this experience that you wish you didn't have to walk through, I want you to understand something. Not only did Jesus guarantee you victory if you remain committed to who he is, but he says, I will, I will ensure your victory by giving you access to some stuff that you didn't have access to. You and I understand. Who do men say that he is? He is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the one sent by God. And here the Holy Spirit of God tell you flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. But my Father in heaven has revealed that to you. And now upon that rock, upon who you are as a, as a understanding believer, I'm going to build my church. You are the church. And the powers of hell shall not conquer. You are in a fight. The church and the culture the church of Christ and the church of the culture. He says, but the church of Christ <laughs> will always last. Be not afraid nor dismayed. Having done all to stand, stand some more. Because in the very end, you will win if you faint not. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for the time you've given us to share, oh God, around your word, understanding who you are to us, but more importantly, who we are to you. 
God, we live in a culture, we live in a world, we live in a space right now where it's broken, it's flawed, it's full of sin. And your church is being assaulted on all fronts. We simply ask you tonight, oh God, where we have become weary, given us, give us renewed strength. Where we have become discouraged, give us renewed hope. Where we have become fearful, give us renewed courage, knowing that as long as we rest on who you are, we will always experience your victory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. This has been TBC, the Experience Bible Study. Thank you for joining us tonight. I hope and pray you have a wonderful rest of this evening and rest of your week. Until next week, peace.